The Sunday after Easter has been in previous centuries a Sunday for holy laughter. The custom has been resurrected, as it were, in recent years. In the ancient church, it was known as the Rhesus Pascalis, because everything sounds better in Latin. The custom was so embraced in the early church that the Pope had to send instructions out to the churches to tone it down. The last thing you want is people having fun in church. So to begin this Holy Humor Sunday, and yet to not wander too far from the matter before us, I'll tell you a true story, absolutely true story. When I was in seminary and sitting for the standard ordination examinations, which all Presbyterian candidates uh, for ministry are required to take, it came time for the theology exam. Closed book, three hours, all students in one classroom, blue books at the ready. We opened the test, and the first question for our consideration was, discuss the doctrine of the ascension. A little odd, but off we went. Except for Ray. My buddy Ray just sat there, stunned. The question might as well have been written in Welsh. The clock was running. I'm writing my brains out about the Great Commission because there's nothing that Presbyterians like more than talking about evangelism, and there's nothing that Presbyterians like less than doing evangelism. Ray is a statue. Finally, after an hour, I notice Ray write one sentence and turn in his blue book. When I finished and turned in my blue books and left the room, I find Ray standing in the hallway. What is the doctrine of the ascension, he asked me. I've never heard it called a doctrine, I replied, so I wrote about the Great Commission. What did you write, I asked. Ray replied, the only thing I could think of Beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life down here. (laughs) Now, you may be a little puzzled as to why we're talking about the ascension today. It was just last week that Jesus was raised from the dead. Here we are, one week removed, talking about Jesus' ultimate departure. In about six weeks, we will celebrate Ascension Sunday, the Sunday before Pentecost. So what's going on here? Well, we've spent since Christmas in Matthew's Gospel. When you focus on one Gospel, you have to stay true to it. When it comes to Matthew's Gospel, there's really no Ascension. There are no clouds that overshadow Jesus and lift him into heaven. There is no gravity-defying exit. Frankly, if we are faithful to Matthew's gospel, we don't know what happened to Jesus' physical presence following the resurrection, which may lead us to conclude that the resurrection had nothing to do with physical appearance. We find Jesus on a mountaintop in Galilee. That shouldn't surprise us. Jesus was taken to a mountaintop during his temptation. Jesus began his public ministry from a mountaintop from which he gave his sermon. Jesus went to another mountaintop to be transfigured. Jesus gave his final sermon on the Mount of Olives. And here is Jesus on a mountaintop at last, ready to depart. In the thinness of the mountaintop, where heaven and earth, things temporal and eternal, seem to commingle, Jesus offers a final word. Now, I spent no small amount of time studying the original Greek of this text. I consulted ancient dictionaries and lexicons. I even read versions of it in Aramaic, which is quite something, considering I have no idea of how to read Aramaic. And the best translation I can offer you of Jesus' words is this. Don't just sit there. 
Now, okay, it's probably more of a paraphrase than a translation. The new Revised Standard Version of it puts it this way. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. All the parables all the miracles, all the conflicts and challenges to tradition and convention have been for a purpose. What Jesus came to do has been completed. Jesus' work is done. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. The one who spoke of welcome, gratitude, inclusivity, forgiveness, the one who had been unjustly and mercilessly tried and executed, the one who has been raised, defeating death, has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. The kingdom of heaven, about which Jesus has preached, spun out parables, and declared and demonstrated in action, has begun. But the world is not yet what it was created to be. What Jesus began was the possibility that the world could be as God created it to be. Like a gardener, Jesus has prepared the soil and carefully planted the seed. But like any gardener will tell you, that is merely the beginning. What is to become of the garden remains to be seen. The kingdom of heaven, which Jesus came to share, has begun. The ground has been prepared. The seed has been carefully planted. And the gardener will no longer be present. How is this garden to grow? Who is meant to tend the seed of the kingdom of heaven that has been planted? Who will keep the weeds and the life-diminishing forces from then and now. Those who follow Jesus, who place their trust in him, who see the truth of his words and the authenticity of his example, will be the ones through whom Jesus accomplishes and completes his work. Through their faithful discipleship, the gospel will go into all the world and new disciples will be created and the kingdom of heaven will expand and expand and enlarge until the world is what God created it to be. And even more shockingly, those disciples include us. If God's plan for the creation is ever to be realized, it will be because of disciples like you and me. That's a little scary, I know. But God is counting on us. I used to believe that if we could just get the right people elected to the right offices, things would be better. History has proven that to be partly true, but the greater evidence is that it is not true. I used to believe that if we could just pass the right laws that were so clearly and sensibly written that things would just be perfect and fair. I used to believe that compassion and understanding were so clearly the norm of human behavior that they barely needed to be mentioned. But I was wrong. What I know now is that the kingdom of heaven, the realm of God, its existence and its reality is up to people of faith. The authority that Jesus gives is not given to governments nor is it given to politics. It is given to people of faith, people who trust in God, people who see the world as God sees it, and are willing to join with God to make the world what God intended it to be. And we are foolish to believe 
that that work is the sole work of the church. That work is shared with faithful Muslims, faithful Jews, and faithful believers of other traditions. When people of faith join together and work together for the well-being and betterment of God's creation, the world is softer and kinder, and God smiles. In its broadest and most profound sense, the Great Commission is Jesus authorizing us to continue his work. It means that we are to invite and welcome all people to this table of grace and blessing. It means not just talking about our faith and debating doctrine and dogma. It means remembering that sometimes Jesus meets us in our lives. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Sick and you gave me healing. I was in prison and you visited me. When we live the lessons Jesus gave us, the world sees, takes notice, and is changed. And my friends, the kingdom of heaven is the change the world is looking for. Jesus' final words to his disciples, and that means you and me, in the Gospel of Matthew, those final words are these. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Trot back to the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, back to where we began months ago. And you read these words. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. I am with you, God with us. Matthew's a pretty good writer. We end where we began. We are not alone. We are not left to our own abilities. We are not left to our own brilliance. I am with you always. Thanks be to God. So there it is. Don't just sit there. None of us have that calling. Don't just sit there. Jesus is risen. And the kingdom of heaven is in our hands for now and evermore. Amen.